This video is brought to you by Slate Black Industries. For grips and accessories, visit slateblackindustries.com. Hello, ladies and gentlemen. So this is the third time this rifle's been out here. First time as an iron-sighted G3, second time as a Swedish pattern AK-4D, and this is the third time it's been out here, and we've enhanced the optics with the input of Swedish marksman instructor Carl. Do not skip the part where Carl talks about the mentality of employing AK-4Ds and why they the Swedes set a 600 meter end goalpost for the AK-4D, even though the rifles can shoot up to 800. So we'll see you there at the debrief. much for this distance but all right well you have a variable power man dial it down oh wait. that's how those things work impact impact we're on at target number two impact impact target number three impact Neutralized. Target number four. Impact. Jeez. Yeah, you're gonna break this one. I can feel it. Impact. Did not break the shot. Target five. Impact. Impact. Target 400. Just off the right edge, perfect elevation. Impact. Impact. Okay, I'm on at 450. Impact. Just off the right edge. Impact. I think you're starting to see the wind, my dude. Yeah. 500. Impact. Impact, center punch on that second shot. Nice. I'm on the gong, should be about 650-ish. Impact. Nice. I could laze it, do you want me to laze it? I'm lazing it. Got it, 720-ish. That might have been just off the right. Impact! Nice. I'm out there at eight. Uh, maybe just left. I know it's going to seem like it was a miss, but it was actually a hit and we spent a lot of time scrubbing this one. First of all, if you look at the observer's view, uh, blown up, it's actually really interesting. You can see how I correct for windage and how the projectile arcs left and then veers back into the target. Now, Josh reminded me that these targets were actually just used in a match over the weekend right before we went. 
So the 500 and the 800 yard targets both had shot indicators on them. And we slowed it down. We zoomed it in. And if you look right here where the indicator is, as the target is impacted, it briefly shines red. And we realized that it was an actual impact. But the impact velocity or the momentum was just so low that we didn't see the plate flex. Maybe it hit it where the post was behind the target. Um, regardless, we just continue to shoot at it afterwards to see what the effect wind would have on it, which was actually good because we were able to see that at this distance, wind actually had a tremendous effect on the M80 type Ball 762 NATO ammunition. Anyways, we'll talk more about it in the debrief. Just thought you'd want to know about that. That was off the right, about a full target. Wind out there is... Yep, just, good, perfect, perfect elevation just on his left edge. Off his right side. Right side. Impact. Dude, it was, it's 100% the wind. It's 100% the wind, not the elevation at all. So you're saying you basically changed nothing except for the optic. Yep. And then... Same ammo. Same we push out to ammo. beyond, to be well beyond, out to 800. Uh, but again, I want to bring this out back to the uh, debrief before we go over it even more because this correlates to our conversation on the Swedish loadout with the Hensel. We'll see you at the debrief. We've made some pretty sweet merch. You'll see under slatesblackindustries.com that we have some pretty cool patches for sale. Currently, we've just released the Black Hawk Down Goodies vs. Baddies with a Gordon Carbine and the Sushka, or AKSU, patches for sale. These are limited stock on hand, so get them while they're available. And I cannot talk in the same depth as Josh can when it comes to the scopes. But the one requirement that I set out for when I was looking at the LPVOs, I was telling Josh, I've noticed that the LPVO market has a tremendous slant for, let's say, an assaulter's LPVO rather than a DM type of LPVO, like a designated marksman or a marksman's LPVO. Um, i.e. Um, uh, an LPVO that can accommodate for wind drop a lot better mm -hmm. and places a lot more of its importance towards the ballistic potential. Now, why LPVO? Instead of, let's say, a DM would usually run 2.5 to 10 or something like yeah, that. Or even potentially greater than that, right? Charging handle mm -hmm. on the G3 right here. It's not that it would hit all the bell housings, but it's nice to be able to hit it into the notch if you are reloading the G3. Mm -hmm. Now, you don't need it, obviously, to like an MP5 to, to, to load it. I think some people have a misnomer that... Yeah, so you have to lock it open. You right? don't on a G3. However, the bell housing also basically gets in the way when you're charging mm -hmm. the, the, the rifle itself yeah. a little more. So an LPVO having a cutoff right here is very advantageous for the operations of it. Furthermore, I personally don't have really a big use for more magnification. I would prefer a good reticle and something that could drop down to 1x to where this could also function in its original role as a battle rifle. Right. So That's a those. really, really concise and well said um, rationale as to why you ended up with an LPVO. So Henry basically asked me then, based on those parameters of LPVO that doesn't have a slant towards the assaulter setup and actually favors a DM setup, what would we go with? And the PLX from Primary Arms with the Griffin Mill is one that, in having now tested pretty much all the LPVOs out there on the market, is one of a very, very small handful that is biased towards uh, the DM role. The overall intuitiveness of the Griffin Mill specifically is just where I've gravitated towards. And, and probably one of the major uh, detractors of this particular setup is less of a concern when you're putting it into a more right. DM style role. So you get to basically discount one of the more 
negative elements, if you would, of this particular LPVO, and you're getting all the advantage that you're really looking for in the, right. uh, in the reticle. So, at the close range, it performed fairly comparable. Yeah, well, comparable, the two. right? Yeah. yeah. As we started to get further out, especially when we got to the 800-yard target, we were really seeing the effects of wind on the projectile, which mm -hmm. it's probably worth mentioning that the projectiles we were shooting were ball ammunition. Uh, 147? Yeah, the, 145. German issued uh, G3 ammo. Quite frankly, that is one of the biggest. That is one of the. Well, it's a limitation of that projectile, right? So once you start to get out to those distances, you know, I could clearly see as the round was arcing towards the target that depending on if there was a slight gust or not of wind of a change of a couple miles an hour, you could see it arcing one way or the other mm -hmm. way, either. It was like traveling towards it and then it just- Right, it was, it as turn. soon as it would hit sort of its max, the max of the, would be parabolic curve? Yeah. The max of the curve. The apex. The apex of the curve. You would see as it would start to arc down towards the target, depending upon what the wind was doing out at that further distance, you'd see it either get caught by the wind and kind of pull mm. off to the side or not, and whether it did or didn't would influence where it would go clearly. Right side. Right the G3 side. system itself, at the end of the day, is limited by the barrel profile and, well, the barrel right. twist of 1 to 12. So it's designed to perform with NATO ball, and, and it performs with NATO and, ball. I would say with the modernized G3 in this instance, you yes, you can run pretty good optics on it. You can run pretty good stocks and forearms with it, and you can reach a decent distance. The problem is, if it is a problem, it's really optimized for ball ammo. Depending on who you are, if you are a Swedish soldier and the Swedish Armed Forces does not have the logistic capacity or it would be a drag on the logistics capacity to issue special, like the US issuing M118LR, mm -hmm. um, then yes, very well, just delink machine gun ammo and shoot it out of the G3. <laughs> I mean, that actually happens in the US Army a lot more than you would think. Huvudmål, vägen. Någon som inte hittat det. The last time we talked, you had talked about how at 800 meters or so the cartridge starts kind of acting funny yeah it's a a acting funny I and mean, you know this but short pair there it's transonic and the, the cartridge is like a football that's get caught in the wind and you can't reliable um what do you call it call it shot shots because you can't guarantee a hit as 800 meters so why why take a shot you can't hit you have to guarantee a hit. I think. That that's the whole purpose with a with a marksman. Otherwise, I could have a uh, eight guys with machine guns, or whatever. Yeah. Okay. No. No. That's 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 really interesting because that that is that's a really that's a really interesting mindset when it when compared to the North American and the Russian mindset. Uh, uh, Carpet of, bombing. <laughs> Well, sort of. I mean, because a lot of times what we talk about, suppressive fire is, is just as important as a direct hit. But then again, then we have the car Gustav or the, the, <laughs> the machine gun for that. So there's, there's other things that would do suppression fire better than a designated marksman. You can do it if the, the situation dictates you have to shoot and uh, pin down an enemy. You, you can accurate, accurately pin down an enemy with a marksman rifle, of course. But the main purpose is to hit the target. The system itself is still tied to the NATO ball cartridge. Um, yeah. And, you know, the G3 runs a slower twist. And so it's really suited for, you know, your 147, 144 grain uh, NATO ball, depending on which... We have good ammunition. I, I, I mean... Uh, I know people that uh, shoot matches with it. So, oh, yeah. they shoot matches with NATO ball. Mm -hmm. A Swedish. Wow. Okay. Yeah. If, if you go back to the logistics about it, if you have a rifle uh, with uh, an other cartridge than the other uh, squad members, in this case, the machine gunner, then you have a logistics pro problem because then you have a machine gunner with a 7.62 and a squad members with 556 five, and then a marksman with it in 
6.5 Creedmoor or 6.555 or whatever. Then the logistics comes into play again. I prefer a bit of weight behind my marksman rifles of the, because of the recoil management when mm -hmm. shooting prone. Shooting kneeled or standing, yeah, it's heavy. But if you shoot prone a lot, then I think it's... Uh, I don't want to shave that much. I mean, the, the 417, uh, I think it's too light when you shoot mm -hmm. distance, like 600 meters. The rifle bounces around. Without the bipod on this, it weighs about 13 pounds or so with this with this scope on it. Mm -hmm. But but it balances extremely well. If you were to sing the praises of the AK4D, what would you say about it? It looks good and it's shoot extremely accurate and well. If you were That's... to say anything bad about the current AK4D, what then I speak say? against myself and, uh, and would say the weight as a battle rifle, uh, the weight and uh, the charging handle. I don't like the, the HK charging handle. I'm used to the AK-5 as my main rifle. So, so the FNC have... is, yeah. Yeah, yeah, the FNC, yeah. So, and then you have the, the charging handle on the left uh, right side. The G3's roller delayed system needs that cam though. Yeah, Otherwise, you're not going to open it. So no, I know. There's, there's nothing you could do about the charging handle. It limits what optic you can run because yeah. the charging handle hits the optic. So that's the main thing I would. <laughs> but yeah, you can't you can't get away from it because of mm. the roller delay blowback. I asked Josh to bring his foul. Oh, no, shh. I asked Josh to bring his scar, one of I think your favorite rifles that's very comparable because basically we're talking about an accurate not an accurized but a dm kitted out assaulter yeah it's like a cross-purposable thing that's like pseudo set up for you know the assaulter kit but that also easily fits into the confines of the dm functionality obviously right. we've taken this one to 800, 800 on the show and the functionality works perfectly fine in that role yeah i would say probably very similar to what we experienced out of the g3 from an overall like functional capability perspective now what scope are you what scope are you running on that one this one's got the knife force uh attacker one to eight on it again it's a one to eight <laughs> well yeah I mean, yeah <laughs> It's a, it's, it's a very similar optic in terms of what it's giving you. It's a 1 to 8 with a yeah. mill grid, uh, just like this is a 1 to 8 with a mill grid. Yeah. Um, you know, I actually think that this particular reticle itself, is I would prefer to have in this as opposed to the, right. the reticle that's in this, with I also, a few exceptions for, for distance specific. But I like the one power low end in this reticle a bit better than in that one. But I also think that you have more of an assaulter slant, yeah, slant than me on the marksman slant. Yeah, I think so. Now, the one issue that comes with the G3 that is with weight, mm -hmm. of course. Now, the balance is a different issue mm -hmm. because essentially what Josh can do right here with a lack of weight, he's able to kit it out with a lot more items that would be performance enhancers, your, your illumination and your suppressor. I mean, right. two very nice items to have in the field. Uh, but that being said, front heavy. So mm -hmm. you're talking about a little bit more. Uh, you're talking about a little bit more kit in the front. Mm -hmm. So you know your operations may be affected slightly. Mm -hmm. uh, but as far as overall weight, yeah, they're they're very, about the same with all of the kit on the scar versus yeah. just this sort of in its base setting. Now I would say on the other hand of that though. The reliability, I would actually favor the G3's reliability over the SCAR. However, we do know some of the issues that the SCAR has due to its light. I would say that when we are talking about reliability, we're not talking necessarily about the ability to feed casings, you know, to right. feed the ammunition, but that the overall longevity of the platform, we've, we have experienced the SCAR basically shaking itself loose. <laughs> yeah. So. I mean, we've heard about that, that, that the scar shakes itself loose. But So I think it, it requires a more refined user to be able to... Pay attention to what's yes. happening, yeah. But I mean, regardless, this has been a, a lot of fun of a project. I think now comes the extra work of 
cutting the classic episode of the AK4D. The G3 to AK4D journey. And then, of course, G, uh, AK4D enhanced. <laughs> so oh, awesome. We'll see you guys in those videos. Take care. Seven one six is Bill Knight six four Vic eight packs red con one green to green top copy over. Bill Knight six this is seven one six Roger over. One six Bill Knight one one pack.